Because I don't need these things over here. I, I'm a dinosaur. Now, can you hear me? me? Tell me. What? You are going to share the birth of the buckaroos, correct? I created the buckaroos. Everybody wants to know why. So I will tell you the story of this and how I became an actor and how I had to feel something to do. When uh, I read a Groucho Marx book one time. And Groucho said in 1912, he was going to audition for a play as a kid. And he went and knocked on the door in New York City. And the producer came out wearing a dress. And he said, is this the business I want to be in? And if anybody remembers a, a comedian named Shelley Berman, Shelly Burbank used to do these wonderful routines, and he did one which I absolutely love because he talked about being an actor, and he wanted to be an actor, but he didn't have the money to go to acting school. So he called his father, and his father said to him, what? You want to be a what? You want to be an actor? What are you silly? Actors, they all got pimples, they all got long hair, they need a haircut, and they're all sissy boys. You want to be a sissy boy? That's kind of what my father talked to me about when I said, well, I wouldn't be an actor. This is after four years in the Air Force, a Vietnam veteran. I want to be an actor. So I went to New York, and I was very lucky. In New York, I was in a theater company for four years. I was the only straight guy in the theater company. <laughs> if everybody remembers the 70s, it was great. Because all the girls would say, Peter, would you drive me home tonight? And I didn't live in New York. I lived in New Jersey because I had two horses, about 40 guns, and I played cowboys. During the day before I went into New York, I played cowboys. I was doing mounted shooting at tape cans that people would throw out in the woods. There are a lot of woods back there. Is anybody, everybody here from Tombstone? You know there are no trees here. <laughs> but there are trees back east. Anyway, I get that. And I was working in New York, and I wanted to be, I wanted to do westerns, because I felt westerns were the only genre that didn't attract the sissy boys. <laughs> so I looked for guys. When I moved out into, into L.A., I brought my two horses, I had a Winnebago, my horse trailer, a truck, my pickup truck, which had Texas plates on it, a God bless John Wayne bumper sticker in the back, and a rifle rack in the window. <laughs> and uh, my girlfriend at the time drove uh, the car out here, so we came in a caravan. And that gave me the name of my company, Caravan West. And that's how that developed. So when I got out here, I wanted to do westerns. And all the stunt guys and all the wranglers, they said, you can't do westerns. You're a New York stage actor. You're not a soap opera. No, you, I said, I cannot ride and out shoot anybody. And then all my friends that I was making out here were all fans of cowboy movies. And we watched cowboy movies and watched them. And we said, the hat's wrong. The gun belt is wrong. The gun is wrong. The saddle is wrong. What is the matter with these people? And everybody, all of us, complained about it. And I thought, there was a tip I got when I first started in the business. And they said, as an actor, you have to invent something to make money when you're not. Because actors don't make a lot of money unless you're one of the top 20. They said, it's a laundromat. What's a laundromat? Well, it's something that makes quarters when you're not working. <laughs> so I thought about it, and I thought about all my friends saying everything is wrong. I said, I'm going to make it right, because I've been studying the West. I've been reading the books. I've been looking at photos. I've been doing all of these things. And I said, all right, I'm going to do it. So I started doing this, and I started going to all of the cowboy shoots. 
end of trail, all these different cowboy shoots, and I started meeting all the guys. And all the guys are saying to me, hey, you're in the movie business. Why don't you make a good Western? And I said, I can't do it without you. Because you guys know what to do. I said, yes, I can ride and I can shoot. But I want you to outride me and outshoot me. And if you can do that, I want you. I want your expertise. So the guys that I started hiring were farriers, horseshoers, horse trainers, leather makers. They made shafts. They made gun belts. They made saddles. They made clothes. When we did Tombstone, we made most of the costumes for that movie. If you're reading these books about, well, Kevin Costner got all the costumes out of Western costume. Fine. He didn't know what he wanted. When I hired the buckaroos for it, I said, guys, you're going to come in in three costumes, three distinct different looks, three guns, different guns, the correct saddle and your horse. So I had a book of the 30 guys I was bringing in. And the first one, a guy named Jemison Bashirs. I did it all in alphabetical order. And Jemison, has anybody here seen a photo from the 1880s of a hash knife cowboy in Arizona? He's standing there, he's got a saddle next to him, he's got his rifle on his shoulder, shaps on. Jemison took that photo, made the shaps exactly like it, made the saddle exactly like it, the gun belt, the same gun, same everything, and took the picture in sepia tone. So, we're sitting in one of these production meetings, and Kevin Jaw, who wrote the script, who I worked with for a year on the script, designing the guns and the saddles, he said, all right, let me see these buckaroos you're bringing in. He opened the book, and he looked at the picture, and he recognized that picture from the 1880s. And he said, that is an Arizona cowboy of the 1880s. That's what I want. Joe, Joseph Poro was the costume designer. Joseph Poro was going crazy trying to get things. He came up to me after the meeting, and he looked at it. He said, where did you get that picture from? I said, it's not a picture. It's one of the buckaroos. He goes, what? He goes, I can't have the extras looking better than the principals. So don't worry about it, we'll take care of it. So one of my buckaroos, Logan Clark, his girlfriend Lonnie, well, had a little company called Island Girl, where she made shirts. She made 400 shirts for the show. Joe brought the material, brought it to Lonnie, and said, this character wears this color, this style, this. She made 400 shirts for the show. I was always dealing with Stetson, so I got to deal with Stetson to get the, uh, the hats. I got the spurs, the shaps, and the boots. I knew all the boot companies that made period boots. And I would go up to them and say, all right, what have you got? Don't worry about it. Don't sell it. Take orders. I'm going to buy all the boots from you. So I did all that. I turned that over to Joe. Joe designed everything. He made everybody look different. He made everybody look cool. If you look at Wyatt Earp, which is the, it's an OK movie, and it's about the history of, of Earp with Coster, but everybody looks the same. I can't tell who Doc Holliday is, or Virgil Earp, or, or Morgan Earp. They're all wearing the same outfits. They're all wearing Buscadero rigs. You know what a Buscadero rig is? I'm glad I don't see too many of them in town with people walking around with them. They weren't invented, created until 1920. They weren't perfected until the 1950s with uh, Arlo Ojala. He perfected the steel line holster and so forth. Uh, Bob McNellis, who ran El Paso Saddlery, where I bought a lot of my gun leather from. I went to him after, 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 the, uh, after the movie, and he said, I don't know which is going to be better, Tombstone or Wyatt Earp. But Kevin Costner called me, and he wanted 50 gun belts for the movie. So I made him 50 correct gun belts, marked the Spangenberg gun shop from Tombstone. He sent it to him. Three days later, he said, I got a call from Kasdan, the director. And he said, what the F are you sending me? I'm doing a movie about gunfighters. I want those gunfighter rigs. So I made 50 
busted arrow rigs for him and sent them to him. So I don't know what they're using in the movie, but if you look at Kaz's movie, they're wearing busted arrow rigs because that's what Kasner wanted, because that's what he thought the West was about. So when I wanted to invent the buckaroos, I wanted to bring these people in. And I said, look, we got guys who are, who, you know, uh, uh, horse, you ain't got a, a horse that loses a shoe? We'll fix it right there on the set. You don't have to call somebody else. We had people who make the gun look. We had the guys on the set were making dummy rounds constantly. I had like, uh, Alex Baldwin. <laughs> we know what a dummy round is. Yeah, obviously he didn't. The, uh, we had people making the saddles. We had adjustments made. Doc Holliday had a rig. Well, we made the rig for him. I brought it down to him uh, at uh, one of the hotels in LA that he was staying at. And then when, he got, when we got to the set, it had to be adjusted and adjusted and adjusted. And I had three leather guys as the part of the buckaroos. And they were adjusting the gun belt, uh, the, the, the holster, the shoulder holster. That's why I wrote, all right, shameless plug. I wrote the book, Tombstone, The Guns and Gear. For years after the movie, everybody was arguing. Hey, this, Doc Holliday wore this, Johnny Ringo had that. I said, I know what they were, I gave it to them. <laughs> so I wrote the book to straighten everybody out and let them know who had what and what type. And then later, I said, no, we got to make good Westerns. We got to make great Westerns. So, wait a minute, I got to give you my motto. My company motto. To copy me, you got to be good. To equal me, you got to be great. To surpass me, <laughs> you got to be kidding. <laughs> Anybody here could use that. <laughs> so later, I wrote another book, The Fringe of Hollywood. Because I'm on the fringe of Hollywood because we're not in the mainstream. The mainstream deals with the same stuff you see over and over and over yes. again. And we all don't like the same stuff over and over and over again. Producer brought that book one time. I went in for a meeting with him. And he picked up the book and he said, have you read this book? This book tells you how to make a Western. I said, read it? I wrote it. <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better line than that. <laughs> so we, we're going on with the buckaroos and I started putting them together and I'm talking to another producer and he kept on saying who knows what's right what one percent of the population and I said yep one percent knows you're absolutely right he said so what I said well we have 330 million people one percent is 3.3 million people if 3.3 million people pay ten dollars to see your movie you just made 33 million dollars and his eyes lit up <laughs> oh wait a minute now it made sense to me. if you look at it if you look at tombstone the original outing was 65 million dollars in the first couple of months Wyatt Earp, quick of the dead geronimo all made 18 million dollars that's a half of 1% going to see the movie. That tells you what you have to do. You want to make it right. I see you have a hat on over there with your sides curled up. All right, put that hat back on. You know, you, you, you know why a lot of you, oh, another taco hat. Oh, what kind of chair is this? You know why a lot of the old time photos you see with the hat bent up like this? It's because when they were drunk in a bar, <laughs> they wore the hat flat to keep the sun off you. How many, how many times have you seen a guy with a hat like this? Yeah. Right? In the movie. I always ask that guy, can you ride a horse? Well, yeah. No, they can't. Because if you're riding a horse and the wind's blowing at you, it's blowing at you. So you lift your head up. Boom, the hat's gone. Can you imagine me in the Arizona desert? for days on end with no hat, you're dead. 
so they were very particular about what they did. The, uh, the tackle hat came about. You know who invented that? The movies! <laughs> In 1915, the old, they had real cowboys working in a lot of the movies. And they were wearing the old time hats. But the director, they had bad lighting. And the director couldn't get, he couldn't see their face, couldn't see their eyes. So he said, fold up the hat, fold up the hat, fold up the hat. Oh, oh, that's cool. Okay, now I can see your eyes. That's how that happened. Then the real cowboys in Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, Montana, they said, well, if the movie's doing that, that looks pretty cool. I'll start doing it. That's how the taco hat was invented. But if you want to do something from, from the 1870s and the 1880s, I, I'm, I'm, I keep on looking around here to see if I see anybody wearing, wearing their uh, bandana. Oh, yeah, that's a great hat. And you've got your tie on right. You know, a lot of people, you see the guys wearing with the triangle in front, with, with the, or with a very long piece of, of uh, fabric flying around. I don't think he's much of a horseman or didn't read any of the books. If, uh, if you, uh, Teddy Blue, we pointed him north. Look at the old books. They said they would get on a horse and they would have to buck that horse out for 15 minutes before they could work with him all day. Can you imagine bucking a horse out and you have this stupid tie floating around like this and it gets caught on the horn? You're dead. It's like you're gonna change your fan belt on your car with your boat with your necktie. It, and this is, this is, these are all the reasons why you do it. When I talk to people about it, they say, well, well, you know, well, they wear the tie like that because uh, they're, they're robbing a bank. <laughs> okay, so you rob the bank with it like that, but are you going to keep on wearing it like that? It's like the guy robbing a 7-Eleven now with the stocking mask over him. Is he going to go to the AMPM with a stocking mask on his face? No, take it off. Wear it the way it's supposed to be worn. The, uh, the knot was always in front until 1895. That's when they started changing it around. That's why the first Western movie made in 1903, The Great Trade Robbery, the guy is wearing his, his neckerchief the modern way at the, where they're doing it then. And it, it kept on with Hollywood. Hollywood is full of idiots. They don't know the business. They don't do the research. They don't care about the Western. They only care about the money. They only care about a job. We don't want to do a job. We want to make art. That's why I put the buckaroos together. That's why I put brought guys in that can outride me and outshoot me, that know how to do things. They make all the gun belts. They make, they make this stuff. People go to me all the time, they go, Wow, do you make that? I said, hell no, that takes talent. I don't have that talent. <laughs> I got the talent because I've been vaccinated with a phonograph needle and I can talk forever. <laughs> but that's what, I, that's, that's what I want to impart to you. There are thousands of books out with photos. Don't look at the internet. Don't look at that Google stuff because there's so many mistakes on that. But look at the good stuff. Look at, go to used bookstores, go to them. And if you want to recreate a character, recreate the character. I just came back from Montana. And speaking of Montana, there is Karen McKechnie out there. Say it, Karen. Karen was my customer <laughs> in Montana. She was a lady. She was a lady. Well, this, the story was about a guy named Jimmy Grinder who was the British Columbia Robin Hood at the turn of the century, 1905, 1908. And uh, we did that. Well, we filmed a couple of days at the Deer Lodge prison in Montana. And that's where the real Jimmy Grinder served his time. They brought out this giant book and they went through the pages and there was a photo of Jimmy Grinder from 1908. And the actor that they hired to portray him looked just like him, and I was amazed at that. Of course, I had to play a, I had to play an Irish livery man. Who bought the stolen horses from, from Jimmy? But that's okay because I'll buy stolen things anytime. 
Anyway, I'd like to bring out the buckaroos and let you take a, take a look at them and see what they do. See how they look. If you want to recreate something, then recreate it honestly. Do your research. Look at it. See it. I wear a stampede string. Yeah, you don't see a lot of stampede strings on hats, but I don't want my hat to fly off. Because I'm an old guy now. I don't want it to get off the horse and go get it. <laughs> anyway, Larry, bring the buckaroos out. Bring on the empty horse. And I always ask people, if you see anything wrong with, with what they're wearing, point it out to me, and I will straighten it out. I will find it out. I will look for it. I will make sure that we are right. Because our job is to bring you, the audience, everything that you need to feel good about a movie. When you leave a movie that we do, we want you to say, I want to see it again. And I want to see it again. And look at what happened at Tuesday. Last year, uh, Kurt Russell and I were in Oklahoma City, and we were talking about it. It's now 30 years, and there's not a Western that has matched it. Not one even close. And I said, it's going to take 50 years. And it's going to take us to do it. And it's going to take an audience like you to say what you want, what you need, what you want to have. We're putting together a TV series right now called Forgotten Guns of Hollywood Movies, which is, if, if you look at Hollywood movies, it's always the Colt single action and the 92 Winchester. We're putting in every gun that was available in the Old West, show you how, how to load it. And that's the problem. Prop guys, customers, they just don't know the particulars. They know what is right and how to do it. They know to have that costume, to have that prop at scene five with this character, they will have it there. But they don't know what the prop should be. Usually prop houses, when, uh, when they're talking about Western guns, they're, the prop guy will go and say, okay, I need 12 Western guns. And the, pro and the prop house goes, okay, yeah, here's 12 Western guns, here, here, and you got them, go ahead. And they put them in the movie. Well. I, my first thing that I ask every time is, when does the movie take place? What year is it? But we, I went out for, uh, with a couple of the buckaroos, we went out for a meeting with a line producer. Anybody know what a line producer is? Yeah. Okay, they don't have to explain. <laughs> That's the guy who makes everything in the line and, and says this is what the budget is for. Everything is budgeted. So we're talking to him, and he has Jesse and Frank James robbing a bank, beginning of the movie. And then he had to have to be captured. And I said, good, what year is this? Because I'll have Jesse and Frank James with the exact style gun belt and the exact guns they used at that time. And he looked at me, and he said, what are you talking about? Jesse James is a fictional character. <laughs> True story. You cannot get that. And I looked at the guys that were with me. I said, okay, guys, we don't have this job. <laughs> like, a director that I've worked with on, on 12 movies. And we're doing these westerns. And he, he just throws everything around. And I said, look, let's do this right. And he said, hey, your mother and my mother aren't going to know the difference. Your mother and my mother aren't going to watch the movie. But the guys who watch it are going to know the difference. They don't understand that. They don't care. And that's what the business is about. It's about a lot of people who don't care. But the audience cares. You want to be entertained. You want to go in there and you want to get your money's worth. And by golly, by gum, I want to give you your money's worth. I want to make you feel good. I want to make you feel, say, I want to come back and, and see this. Now here we have <laughs> all the guys. Anybody see anything wrong up there? 
No taco hats. Bent up hats. No rescue No guns tied around the lake. You know, if you have a, a regular gun in a regular period holster, you could draw that faster than 99 of the Hollywood movies that were made with the Buscadero ring. Because the guy always has to tie it around his leg. Well, while he's tying it, you're shooting him. <laughs> and then he has to flip the hammer thumb off, uh, off the holster. You're shooting him. You don't have that stuff. You don't need that stuff. The old style holsters, you can ride any kind of horse. That gun's not going to fly out. Not if it fits properly. The, uh, all of that stuff was embedded again by Hollywood. Anybody see uh, Marlon Brando when he did uh, Viva Zapata? Yes. There's a scene in there where he has like a hundred guys on horses and he gets on his white horse and he runs out, gets on his white horse and he rides away. Well, if you look at it, his gun goes flying out of his holster. <laughs> and he should be spending the rest of the movie going, does anyone see my gun? <laughs> So what Hollywood started doing was when they brought the Buscadero rig in, they wanted to get fast draw. Fast draws didn't exist in the Old West. Back shooting, yes. Fast draws, no. So they said, well, let's lower the holster down so you can reach it. Does anyone know why that Buscadero rig was invented? All right, I'll tell you. Good idea. <laughs> in 1920, Tom Three Persons, who was a lawman in Texas, went to El Paso Saddlery, and he, he was driving a car now. He wasn't riding a horse. So picture him in a car. When you have the right style holster, your gun is way up here. But when you have the Buscadero rig, your gun is now here. You can grab it and pull it faster because he's in a car, not a horse. So Hollywood adapted it, even in 1929, with uh, Gary Cooper in the Virginian. He wore a Buscadero rig. Why? So what happened is they started lowering the holster. Now the actor's running. And the holster's flapping. <laughs> oh wait, let's put a tie on it, tie it around his leg. So now they tie it around his leg. But because the holster is cut so low and the holster is now tied around his leg, the gun is flying out while he's running. Yeah. Let's put a hammer thong on it to hold the gun in. Well, all that is fine for those guns, but they're not historically correct. They're not period correct. They have nothing to do with the Old West. So anybody wearing uh, Buscadero rigs, put them on your wall and say, this is part of history, but it's the wrong history. You want to recreate what was there. You are here. You are in Tombstone, Arizona, one of the top four towns of the West. The town, too tough to die. Honor it. Recreate it historically correct. And you'll feel so much better. Is there anything else you want to know? Any questions? Anybody have a question? Yeah. Could you uh -oh. tell us about some of the costumes? What costumes? Could you tell us about What's so special about Well, those aren't costumes. Those are clothes. We don't want to see them naked. Who do, you, who do you want to see? You want to see one of the women? Oh, there you go. <laughs> go Carol, get out there and tell me about your dress. Um, this was made by... Uh, Talk about it. This was a, a custom made, and uh, she's no longer in business, unfortunately. But what year is it? Uh, it's 1870s, 18, early 1880s. Do you have a bus along? <laughs> I'll leave. <laughs> what do the shoes look like? Yeah. Are they or working? Shh. <laughs> That's what I like about the Buckaroos because they know what they're doing. And they tell me, hey, this is correct for this period. This is what was here in 1875. This is what was in 1882. Things evolved. Everything evolved. Saddles evolve. When you, you, you watch all these modern movies, and they all have modern roping saddles. How many times have you seen a movie with, with the rubber wrapped around the horn? Because they're ropers. They're good cowboys, but they're ropers. And I always say, when did a spare tire, when was that invented in the old West? <laughs> the reason why they put a rubber around it is because they're using a nylon rope, and that cuts down on the friction. They don't use grass ropes. 
They don't use rawhide riatas. It's, it's amazing. When I bring them out, they go, what's that? <laughs> a rawhide riata. How does that work? Same way your nylon rope works, but you know how to use it. <laughs> anyway, any other guy? There, get up by your clothes. All right, so the boots are custom made. Um, they're of the correct period for the 1880s. They have a heel on them. The uh, holster that I wear is a reproduction of an F.A. Munich. He was a holster maker out of Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, the gun I'm carrying is from 1894. It's a real Colt uh, gun from the period. And I wear a money belt. And money belt's very popular for cowboys back in the day. Uh, you had a horse, and if you got stopped and they asked you about your horse, you had to produce the papers. So typically a cowboy would carry the papers for his horse in his money belt, and they would also carry some of their money, like silver dollars. They would wear it in his belt, and when they would get to town, they would dump it out. So that's one of the things. And then the hat I'm wearing is actually, it's a copy of a hat in the Sears and Roebuck catalog from the day. Uh, it's called the Never Flop. Okay, and there's actually several of the guys that wear never flop hats. They're, they were a sturdy hat. Um, they're made of 100% beaver, so in the rain, they don't sag or change shape. Um, I wear a leather band on mine, and this was a 35 cent upgrade. So, I lost only extra 35 cents. Clementine, the big movies, Tombstone, the town too tough to die, and others. We were lot to the dedicated folks who take time to bring us the look into the past. It's best so we find those people who take the time to be accurate, bring us the correct information, look at the very firearms, ammunition, wardrobe, and so forth. A number of years ago, I decided to make the Legends of Tombstone a world for those people who have dedicated themselves to the West, the heritage, that have made a mark as for us to remember. Previous recipients have been Michael Bean, Mr. Buck Taylor, and Mr. Bob Bell. And it was my honor and privilege to present the Legend of Tombstone Award to a true legend of Tombstone, Mr. Peter Sharanko. I mean, 
Normally I'm speechless. <laughs> oh, wait, no. Normally I'm not speechless. No, I'm not speechless that we do. I am absolutely thrilled. Larry it did an outstanding job. This is fantastic. So this is a reward of what happens when you put your heart into your work. Amen. And you'll never have to work a day in your life. Now, I'm an old guy now. I'm, I get on sets and I'm like the oldest guy there. But I still have fun and guys still can't keep up with me. Because they don't have the work ethic that I have, that people of our generation have. And what we try to do is do something. So, as Buffalo Bill said, Follow your own spirit guide and cut your own trail. Find out what you want to do. Remember the movie uh, City Slickers? Yeah. And they asked Jack Palance, what is the thing? And he said, one thing. And Billy Crystal said, well, what is it? He says, you have to find it out. So my one thing in my life is I want to make the best Westerns possible. I want to feel proud of the work that I put into it. That's why I have the Buckaroos, because they help immensely on, on, on everything. They, you know, usually you have background players on shows, and they're permanent street walkers. The second AD is going, OK, I want you to go over there, you walk over here. You and I said, no, let me bring people in that know what they're doing. Let me bring a general store guy in. And he's dressed like a general store guy. And instead of him walking around, he's out on the sidewalk sweeping. He's not working. You ever see horse shit in a movie? <laughs> Very seldom. Because in the Old West, they had somebody cleaning it up. So I wondered what one of the buckaroos is. They get a barrel, put some wheels on it, and you're walking around with a shovel and a rake, and you're cleaning up after the horses. Oh, I didn't think about that. This is the, uh, <laughs> does anybody remember me in Tombstone having a couple of lines? <laughs> I had a whole bunch of them. But when they cut the movie down, and you'll hear this from a lot of people, they cut lines out from everybody. I walked into the bar one night, and Jim Jacks, the producer, was uh, arguing with Powers Booth, the late Powers Booth, who was a great guy, and I loved working with him, and Michael Bean. And they were arguing, they say, we want our lines back, we want our lines back. And he says, I can't do anything about it, I can't do anything. And they walked away. And I walked over to Jim, and I was gonna buy him a beer. He said, hey Jim, let me buy you a beer. And he looked at me, and he goes, Pete, I can't get Michael Bean or Powers Booth their lines back. I can't get yours back. And I said, ah, don't worry about it, Jim. I got a great outfit. I love what I'm doing. And you know what? Ideal Toys was on the set today. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, what? He says, yeah, they like my outfit so much, they're going to make a doll out of it. <laughs> so Jim Jacks goes, whoa, wait a minute. I, I got to get a piece of this. And I said, yeah, but the funny thing is, when you pull a little string on the back, it doesn't I say anything. <laughs> In spite of all the problems we had on filming the movie Tombstone, I cherish that movie so much, and I'm so honored to be so much a part of it. I worked with Kevin Jar for a year before we did the movie. We did a thing called the House of Men Ride. Anyone know what a House of Men Ride is? Well, we would meet once a week. Uh, Kevin, uh, Gary Gang, who ran a boarding stable in Silmar, and Frank Trigani, who was my assistant buckaroo coordinator, ran a saddle shop in uh, Studio City, had his horse at Gary's, and uh, I brought Kevin out and Gary got Kevin a horse. So for the year, we would ride, I would bring my horse up from my place, and we would ride every night, at, uh, once a week, at nine o'clock at night. Each of us would have 100 rounds of live ammunition, 
a pint of whiskey, and cigars. And we would ride up in the hills and just blindly shoot at imaginary targets. And we didn't come back until the whiskey was gone or the ammunition was gone. And that's what gave Kevin the idea of making Tombstone. And then we worked on that for a year where he taught, where he was so adamant about what he wanted, what style of holster he wanted. I said, no problem, we'll have that made. What style of hat he wanted, no problem. Stetson made 200 hats for us. They were called Australs at the time, but they were based on the boss of the planes, which was a four inch brim and a four inch crown. They don't make that anymore. Stetson did an ad with me one time, and I, I go up to their outlet store. So a couple years after the movie, I go up to their outlet store to buy more hats, and there's a picture of me with a hat on from Tombstone, and the uh, girl working at the store said, yes, can I help you? So I stood in front of the picture, and I said, uh, can I have a hat like that? <laughs> she didn't recognize me. <laughs> I don't think we have that anymore. <laughs> yes, I'm a major who in Hollywood. You mention my name and they go, who? <laughs> or they go, oh, him. You know, there's a five stages of an actor. There's the who, oh, him. Get me him. Get me somebody like him. Who? <laughs> Those are the five stages. My agent called me one day and he said, I got a call from a casting director. And they want to know if I had a Peter Shereko lookalike. He said, I represent him. He said, no, 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 we can't afford him. I said, wait a minute. They can afford me. He said, wait, I went from the who to the old him to get me somebody like him. I missed to get me him. That's where you make the money. <laughs> And that's why I started the business of, of doing this. So we do costumes, we do props, we do horses, guns, we do all that stuff. And uh, since we did Tombstone, we've worked on over a thousand different shows. Wow. We're always working, Peter. Always, always. You what? We're always working. I'm always.